Happy Monday. On today's episode of the John Campus Show podcast, Anthony Mackie confirms that there's not going to be a Falcon and Winter Soldier season two and why he's kind of bummed out about that. Also, Scream 7, apparently there are two more series veterans that are coming back for Scream 7 as well. Ghostbusters had a pretty big opening weekend and Scarlett Johansson is apparently going to be the new lead of the upcoming Jurassic World films. That and a few things more. The John Campus Show podcast starts right now. Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie-related show on the planet Earth, the John Campus Show podcast, coming to you from right here in our quaint little studio, brought to you today in part by our friends at Miracle Made. I'm, of course, your host, John Campy, and it is an awesome honor and privilege, as it is every day, to have you, our international friends, gather around as we talk about our favorite things in the world, movies and movie news, TV and streaming, and all sorts of good stuff, Not just giving you our opinions, but also giving you some information and context so you guys can form your own well-informed opinions, whether they're the same or completely different than ours. Uh, Joining me in studio today, we got producer Jonathan Voico. Hello, everybody. Writer, director, producer Robert Meyer Burnett. Bustin' makes me feel good. (laughs) And not joining us today is Ray Ora. He got a (laughs) toothache. So uh, he's off to the dentist today, so we'll probably, maybe, see him back again tomorrow. But most importantly... You guys are here. Thank you so much for being here and making this little show a part of your day. And here's how today's show is going to go. We're going to start off by talking about those topics I listed off. And then in the second part of the show, we're going to take your live comments and questions. If you have a thought, theory, opinion, question, or observation that you'd like us to address, go ahead and use the Super Chat feature in the live chat. And as long as it's appropriate for us to address on the show, we will address it in the second part of the show. All right, guys. That all down. Let's get things started with this, shall we? You know, Falcon and the Winter Soldier wasn't the first MCU show to come to Disney+, Plus, but it was one of the more anticipated ones, particularly for me. Um, You know, Anthony Mackie is one of those treasured gems inside of the MCU. And, of course, Sebastian Stan, everybody loved him as Winter Soldier. And so they decided they were going to go ahead and do this show, Falcon and the Winter Soldier, had a lot of people excited. I particularly got really excited. Because my all-time favorite mixed martial artist, George St. Pierre, good Canadian kid, was going to be in it playing Batroc. Uh, he's going to reprise. He was reprising his role as Batroc the Leaper. I love him. Not a great thespian, George. I love you anyway. But you know, he was in there too. Now, I didn't love the show. I didn't love it, but I liked it, and it certainly had some things going for it. In particular, I love the chemistry between Anthony Mackie and Sebastian Stan, and you throw in Daniel Bruhl in that mix. I thought Daniel Brule was great in the show. I mean, his dance meme is still one of the best things on the internet, has had in a long, long time. But when they announced that Anthony Mackie was going to be starring in Captain America 4, a lot of whispers started going around about, well, I guess we're not going to get Falcon the Winter Soldier. And in headlines going around today, Anthony Mackie has confirmed, yep, no Falcon the Winter Soldier season two. They've moved everything over to movies now. This comes from the folks over at Game Radar, quoting Anthony Mackie saying this, The Falcon and the Winter Soldier, I really enjoyed doing that show. I was actually excited to do a second season, just so me and Sebastian Stan can get paid to hang out, Mackie told Radio Times. Because it's like me, him, and Daniel Brühl, it's kind of like the perfect storm of happiness. Mackie also revealed that Stan and Brühl (laughs) wouldn't be reprising their roles for Captain America 4, meaning we won't be seeing Bucky Barnes or Hamid Zemo, uh, Zemo in the film. When they decided to go back to the movies... It is what it is, but I don't have my friends anymore, so it kind of dampens it a little bit. Listen, what if I love Anthony Mackie? I do too. Right? The the dude, even when he's in press conferences and stuff like that, he's just so authentic. And he speaks from a very, you know, personal point of view when he's talking about stuff. So hearing him talking about, yeah, I was just really looking forward to do second season because I just want to hang out with my buddies. It's a lot of fun. I am a little bit surprised because even though, Rob, we had never heard. Anybody say that, you know, that Sebastian Stan was going to pop up in Captain America 4 or that Daniel Brühl would pop up in Captain America 4? I think there was a part of me, and and honestly, I think there were a lot of other people who had a part of them feel like we're kind of half expecting them to pop up. But according to Anthony Mackey, that's not happening either. Rob, I understand the move to the big screen. I get it. It's hard. You can't go jumping back and forth between big screen and small screen. I get that. But are you surprised to hear that they're probably not doing 
a, a Falcon Winter Soldier season two or a captain in Winter Soldier season two? And is it the right move? What do you think? I guess I'm not surprised, John, because they're moving both. Anthony Mackie is doing his Captain America films and then Sebastian Sands going over to Thunderbolts. So I understand we're not losing either one of them. They're going to have a much larger presence in the MCU. I have to say that while I know they had to rejigger the plot of Captain or Falcon Winter Soldier because of the pandemic, I really like the show. And I like the show because at its at its center was something that was fundamental to the MCU itself, which is, is Falcon... Is Sam Wilson worthy of of picking up the mantle of Captain right, America? Right. That was, I, I think, from a storytelling standpoint, from an MCU standpoint, that was a driving thrust of that story. And and when he he had that central conflict, he was told by somebody he respected, "No, you shouldn't. It's not worth it. These people will always let you down." And he said, "You know what? Despite that, I'm going to do it anyway." And I felt that the resolution of that series was quite in a way moving now was it a little political was it politically overt at the end you do better senator you know they've used that as a meme yes i understand that might have been a little heavy-handed but it fit with the theme of what we were seeing and i liked watching i think anthony mackie's a tremendous actor i liked his transformation and let me just say john that action figure the hot toys figure of him cap that captain american cool. suit's a banger dude very good one but no i really like the show and um i like the character and and i look despite all the production issues that that captain america 4 is having i've got my high hopes for it i i want it to be great because i love him i love him as captain america and um i wish him all the best because i really like anthony mackie as a performer yeah well, i think one of my favorite things about Falcon Winter Soldier. Well, particularly was when uh, Bucky and um, Sam's sister started to hit it off. And Bucky and Sam's reaction to all that, that was great. But I also really like that they did some things in it that made it feel a little more real world. Yes. And like one, one of the things that really stood out to me, because I think some people found it silly, but for me it really worked. When right from the first episode we find out that Bucky is in the process of actually... He's doing therapy. Right. And he's going around trying to find people who might be still alive that he has wronged. And then the fact that, like, the the old man that he's hanging out with, like, he killed his son. It, like, they just, <clears throat> it was, like, just really good drama. I thought there, to know? Know, and even, look, I'm always banging on about they've really never dealt with the real world implications of the snap. And when you find out that him and his sister are trying to get a bank loan to restore their family boat. But he hasn't been around for five years, so he literally has no credit right? because yeah. of the snap. And, you know, I thought that was a really interesting – it seems silly to say, but to me that made the ramifications of what Thanos had done, you know, to take them and make them every day and maybe a little mundane, really hit home about how this would affect everybody's life. And I really like what they did there. But, you know, they also introduced something in the show that – I understand why they've dropped it all together – but they introduced something in that show that Marvel has never touched on again. And I, I get why they're not touching on it because I don't know how you address it. But in the show, they specifically asked the question. After five years, the world started to feel normal again, right? Like this, this is what life is now, right? At five years after the snap. For all of a sudden, three billion people suddenly reappear that were not there yesterday like okay yeah we've asked the questions what about you know the wife who lost her husband and then eventually moved on now the husband's back what about you know the the people who disappeared and their house was there so somebody else bought the house and lives there now and these people are back and like like half like three billion people reappearing and they touch on that in falcon winter soldier but I've not seen anything in Marvel ever mention it again about the complications that would have. But still, I, I get why they didn't. Manifest did that pretty well, though. That just did Manifest a microcosm. Did that, but yeah. no, I, I I agree with you because it they could have taken this. I mean, what a disruption of of the planet, and they could have explored this on many different levels because, you know, you would have had housing itself would have fallen into disrepair. You know, these five all those domiciles empty, all that infrastructure empty. How many how many farmers? weren't making as much food because there was half the demand went away and then all of a sudden yeah all of a sudden you've, you've doubled the how do you get all needs. those how do you yeah. get all that stuff to people you know what i'll be honest 
I'm impressed that they even brought it up in Falcon the Winter Soldier because most of these like genre kind of movies and shows and franchises, they don't ever address normally the consequences of what happened in right. previous chapters. So at least they did touch on it. But no, at any did. rate, guys, question is for you. What do you think about this? The fact that Anthony Mackie seems to confirm that there's not going to be a Falcon Winter Soldier season two. I think a lot of people suspected that. But I was kind of looking forward to seeing more chemistry between them. Maybe they will pop up in movies together soon. Whatever you guys think, jump down to the comments section below and let us know. All right, guys. That down. Let's move on to this, shall we? So Scream 7 is coming. Now, and of course, one of the big things that happened in Scream 6 was Sydney was not there. And a lot of people said, you can't have a Scream movie without Sydney, without Nev Campbell. You can't, you can't do it. Well, they did. And it turned out pretty well. I, they, I mean, for a Scream movie, it did it did pretty well financially at the box office. I mean, it's not like it's a huge global hit. I think it made $160 million worldwide. But still, by Scream standards, that's pretty good. Well, recently we found out that Nev Campbell was returning. And that made a lot of Scream fans happy. But now, according to reports, a couple of other series veterans are coming back. One of which I thought was done with Scream. But this comes just from the folks at Joe Blow who wrote the following. We've heard that executives were hoping to get her Scream 3 co-stars, that's Nev Campbell's co-stars, Patrick Dempsey, to join her in this one, reprising the role of LAPD detective Mark Kincaid and industry scooper Daniel Richmond hears that Dempsey is in talks to do just that. Richmond source also claims that Courtney Cox is locked in to return, which I had heard that she was moved on now from Scream. Of course, she has done this forever, too. It was locked into return as author and reporter Gail Weathers, uh, which would make sense because Cox has never missed out on any of these movies. Now, of course, there's been some drama surrounding the Scream franchise where uh, two of the leads of the last couple of movies were no longer there. One over a lot of political nightmare stuff over tweets and stuff like that. And that got really, really messy. Uh, what has come out now, Jen Ortega's rep is apparently confirmed that she wanted more money, which is understandable. Jen Ortega is worth more money now. She wanted more money. She's gone. Rob, obviously getting Nev Campbell back is a big deal for this franchise. She is the Luke Skywalker of the Scream franchise. Uh, getting others, like the original, the writer of the original Scream is directing this new one. That's kind of... Kevin big. Williamson. Courtney Cox is returning, who's the other big mainstay. I guess she's the Han Solo of, of this franchise. <laughs> and... Well, only appearing in one movie, still, you know, Patrick Dempsey, who I believe is the current reigning uh, sex People's Magazine Sexiest Man Alive, beat out Jason Kelsey uh, for that uh, for that title. Is this a significant move, getting these two back with Nev Campbell and having the three of them together? Not a significant move. Is nothing going to move the needle for Scream one way or the other? How do you what do you think about it? Well, I think being that Scream is a meta franchise you know it's commenting on the genre that it's a part of to bring back a character like patrick dempsey is a perfect it's perfect fodder for the movie you know i mean i could see him end up ending up as the killer you know or right. something like that i mean it's because why not i the, the fact that there's even a scream seven i wish jamie kennedy could come back from the grave or whatever and comment on how ridiculous it is that there's a scream seven but i you know look if you're a fan of this franchise the thing about this franchise is none of them have been terrible you know there's been others I that disagree are... <laughs> well i mean <laughs> i think a couple of them have been terrible i think it's they're watchable i mean i like the characters and the machinations you know and i i i think it's kind of cool that they're at least they're trying to do this you know, it's, it's, and they're going to get some money for it too, because it's not like these movies, they've been doing okay. Yeah, so but they got to pay. But at the same time, the, the last one made a grand total worldwide of 160 something million dollars. It's not like they're getting Star Wars or Harry Potter or MCU money. No, but if they spend 25 million, it's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I mean, not for any one of them, but maybe for like for the whole cast. <laughs> yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah, for the I mean, whole cast. <laughs> I could see that. Look, again, to me, I get I get people mad at me all the time, but I, I keep going back to this. Like, the, whenever a discussion comes up about the great, like, horror film characters, you know, inevitably somebody will bring up Ghostface. And then I get in trouble with people because I say, there is no Ghostface. Right. Like, what are you talking about? There is no Ghostface. <laughs> Every single, there is not, it's, this is not Freddy Krueger 
or Mike Myers or you know Jason Voorhees or whatever that's there. That's that they're there. They're back. Every movie, it's a different. It's just some other Yahoo putting on a mask and calling themselves oh, Ghostface. Right. And eventually, to me, that gets a little tiring. I suppose. By the way, I was going to ask you about this. I know this has nothing to do with this particular topic. Sort of. Did you see the trailer for the movie? It's a horror film that's told from the perspective of the killer. And the killer's like a Jason Voorhees creature that's come back from the dead. No, I, it sounds a little bit like Behind the Mask, The Rise of Leslie Vernon. It's bit, not but. like that. It's it's more the supernatural. The, and I saw that it's going to be on Shudder. It's coming out in the theaters. But I, I saw it. I'm like, oh, I'm in. I'll totally. You see the killer like get hit by lightning, and he rises up from the ground, and he's and it's got from a mask. their perspective. Yeah, and it's from the, his perspective, and I'm okay, like, that's interesting. I'll watch that. <laughs> that's that's interesting. I don't know what it's called though. All right, guys. Question is for you. What do you think about that? We we're getting a bunch of the original, you know, people coming back for Scream again. Courtney Cox come back. Nev Campbell's already there. Now we're talking about Patrick Dempsey, the original writers back there. Do you think that's going to move the needle for people or hardcore fans of the Scream franchise? Maybe yes, maybe no. Whatever you guys think, jump down to the comment section below and let us know your thoughts. All right, guys. With that down, let's move on to this, shall we? Well, Ghostbusters has opened up this weekend. Of course, we did our review of it last week just to kind of give you a little bit of summary. I thought it was all right. I, I mean, in a thumbs up or thumbs down world, I... I marginally give it a thumbs up. I mean, I didn't like the first two acts of the film, but the third act of the film kind of salvaged it a bit. And it is what it is. I think the franchise should be done now. But listen, it just had its opening weekend and it did pretty well. This comes to us from the folks at Box Office Pro who wrote the following. As Dougie Fresh once said, the Ghostbusters are back <laughs> and all brand new. Ghostbusters Frozen Empire, the fourth film in the IP's legacy timeline and fifth film overall, has taken in a projected... 45.2 million in its opening frame, just slightly above Ghostbusters Afterlife's debut, which is roughly about the same amount of money, to place number one for the weekend. This was at the highest end of our predictions. It was also enough for the franchise to cross the $1 billion mark globally. So the franchise, five films, has now crossed the $1 billion mark globally. By the way, side note, as an overall thing about the uh, st status of the box office, stuff like that, this is the third movie in March to open with over $45 million. Obviously, Dune Part 2 opened in March, with, uh, well north of 45. Kung Fu Panda 2, or 4, I should say, opened up north of 45. And by the way, next this week, we've got Godzilla X Kong, which is projected to open to over 45. We could March could up with four films that open over March 45 Madness, million. John. Yeah. March I mean, Madness. Good for them. I mean, I know the, ghost, the Ghostbusters, the theaters needed this, but the Ghostbusters needed it too. Now, this is roughly about the same amount of money as Ghostbusters Afterlife. I think Ghostbusters Afterlife made like 44 point something. So it was within about a million dollars. So roughly the same opening. And I'll admit, I'm a little bit surprised it opened this high. Because I did not feel the same amount of anticipation that Ghostbusters Afterlife had leading into it. Not that there was a huge amount of hype and excitement for Ghostbusters Afterlife. But I mean... I just felt there was more there than there was for this. I haven't felt a lot of enthusiasm from a lot of people. So for it to open to 45 is actually pretty impressive. I don't know what, I don't think it's going to have the same kind of legs that Afterlife did. I don't know how good the legs of it will be. I think it's generally enjoyable, but I didn't think it was as good as Afterlife. But I got to say, I think this is a pretty impressive number for them to open with. What did you think about the opening for the film? Uh, you know, I thought it was fine. I thought it was good. I mean, it, 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 these aren't they're keeping the price of these down you know they're not spending exorbitant sums of money to make these movies which i think is a good thing i think they understand i mean i didn't like this movie as much as i liked afterlife yeah me too and i i thought it was fine i mean it's it's weird to me to see this franchise moving forward i'm glad paul rudd's getting more work outside of ant-man you know he's still relevant and and he never hurts for work, though. I mean, no, yeah, Paul it, Rudd it, never it, hurts for work. It's true. I, but I, 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 look, I think any time, look, any movie that gets made, I'm happy that it makes money, especially at the studio level. I would like to have seen something a little bit more original, maybe a little bit more edgy when it comes to this movie. It seems like they're kind of repeating a trope that's now kind of a Ghostbusters trope. 
Yeah. Oh, there's a new ancient uh, evil. A, a new that's ancient evil that's a, a large yeah. apocalyptic threat that we need to take care of. And and at, okay, I guess what do you do? It's a Ghostbusters movie, but it was fine. But I'm glad it made money, and I'm glad people like it. That's all you can ask for. Do we know, Jonathan, what the budget on this? Does anybody know what the budget on this was? Because I'll look that up. I, it'd be interesting to know because somebody I did open mic yesterday, Rob, and somebody wrote in and and one hundred how much hundred hundred million so probably about forty or fifty on marketing so they don't need maybe two fifty three hundred to break even actually less than three hundred probably around two fifty to break even but somebody articulated something one of our viewers yesterday on open mic they hadn't really thought about it, and they said you know despite the fact that this movie takes place in New York. For me, it feels really small. Like they said, like 80% of the movie either takes place in the firehouse or right. in that off-site lab. And it feels just very small. And I thought, you know, you know what? That's been something that's been itching in my brain. I've never been able to really put that into words, but it was true. It, it felt like a small film despite the fact that it was in New York. Yeah, and it's interesting because the first Ghostbusters feels big and expansive. You know, they're shooting on real locations. They're they're outside a lot. You've got that great moment when all the ghosts get unleashed and you see the big exterior shots in New York and the, mm -hmm. it's magic, magic. You know, the it's, I feel the same way. I thought this movie felt, but that's, I think, by design. And and here they, they face a problem. Actually, they face two problems. This movie faces two big titan-sized problems. This week, Godzilla x Kong opens up too tight so you're right mm -hmm. and the, it's not a tremendously dissimilar demographic they're going no. after and despite the fact that it had i think a very impressive opening weekend with 45.2 million i think we're seeing a greater than 60 percent drop next weekend because number one i don't think it's good enough to get a lot of repeat viewing even though i generally like the film i i have no plans to go back to watch it again and i don't think right. a lot of people have plans to watch second time and then even for a lot of people um, who haven't seen it yet, I, I think Godzilla X Kong's going to open and they're going to be thinking, or we could watch the giant ape and the giant lizard fighting other giant things. And I think a lot of people are going to... So I'm thinking maybe a $15 million second weekend. Ooh, that wouldn't be good. <clears throat> Especially if Godzilla... They're projecting Godzilla X Kong anywhere from 45 to 55 to 60 million opening. And if it can do that, that's going to eat up a lot of the... The box office for them, so the, it it could be in trouble. It may or may not actually get to to uh, break even. Question is for you guys: What do you think about this? I'm actually very pleasantly surprised about how well Ghostbusters: um, Frozen Empire did on its opening. Forty five point two million dollars is nothing to sneeze at. As good as the last film, and I didn't think it would. What kind of legs will it have, though? Will it get repeat viewings? Is it going to run into two titan size problems with Godzilla X Kong? Whatever you guys think, jump down to the comments section below and let us know your thoughts. You know, before we go into our, our last topic here, did you see that Euphoria Season 3 got delayed? Did you see that? No. Yeah, it, it was in the Hollywood Reporter today that Euphoria Season 3 They've delayed it, and they've released all the cast to go and pursue other act acting opportunities. Oh. Now, they're still saying they're still going to do it, but I wonder if it's ever going to happen because when they started Euphoria, it was a, a show with a bunch of no names and Zendaya, right? Yeah. Now you got to pay for Zendaya, who's way bigger now than she was when they started the show. Sydney Sweeney, who was a nobody and is now a superstar. I, how do you pronounce it? Like Jacob Elordi? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's suddenly a name. So like, okay, that's great. You're delaying this now. Good luck on getting those three back together right. again with the way their schedules are going and what their cost. I, I wonder if this show's ever going to happen. to is ever, if, ever, if it's ever going to get. That's a good three. point. I mean, I, I wouldn't surprise me if it doesn't. So yeah, we'll, we'll see. We'll see. All right. With that down, guys, let's get into our final main topic here today, shall we? Say what you want about the Jurassic World franchise. Even the last one, which I know wasn't so hot, still made a billion dollars. A billion dollars at the box office. We don't get to say that much anymore. In all of last year, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, but only two films hit that mark. A uh, short Italian plumber by the name of Mario and a come-to-life plastic doll in Barbie. 
Oppenheimer got close. Close. Oppenheimer got real close, but only two films joined the billion dollar mark. Jurassic World still made a billion, even though it was probably the least liked out of the Jurassic World films. Still did a billion. Now they're doing more. We knew there was going to be a new cast. I expected to hear interesting casts, but I didn't expect, Rob, to hear major A-list talent connected to it. But coming out of the Hollywood Reporter, that's exactly what we're hearing is being attached. They said this, Scarlett Johansson is in is taking a bite out of the new out of a new blockbuster. The actor is in talks to join Universal's new Jurassic World movie. The Hollywood Reporter has confirmed. Universal is moving quickly on the film, which has a July 2nd, 2025, so like a year and a half from now, release date. Gareth Edwards is directing the new Jurassic World, which has a script from Jurassic Park scribe David Coop. Edwards stepped into the role after David Leach exited following a short attach short, it was like 48 hours, a short attachment to the project. All right. Now, something that needs to be made very clear here. It hasn't said she's signed on the dotted line yet, but they've confirmed she's now in talks. Now, once you get to that stage of actually negotiating the contract, that means you're at a point where the studio has decided you're the person we want and the person has decided I want to be a part of this. Once you reach that point, then you get into the negotiations and try to figure out the details. And Rob, what we have seen traditionally is about eight times out of 10, not always, but about eight times out of 10, by the time they get to the point that they are now in talks for it, it usually turns out to be. So I think we can operate right now on the assumption, although it's, it's again, it's not confirmed yet, it's not signed, but let's operate for now just going under the idea that she's going to be the new lead in this. I'm shocked shocked. I did not expect to see a name like Scarlett Johansson pop up in this. Cause honestly, she's like one of the Queens of the business right now. Right. You got her Anya Taylor joy. Um, I mean a few other names that you could throw out there as well, but I'm really, really surprised to hear a name of her size is actually talking about joining it. And it actually kind of tells me that universal and who knows how good or bad the new movie will be. But they're not messing around. Right. Like, they may strike out, but they're going to swing for the fences. And I, I got to respect that. Even if it, the movie turns out to be a big mess and it ends up being terrible, they are clearly not half-assing it. I mean, and we see that right away with, like, who they're going after cast. So I would personally love to see Scarlett Johansson in something like this. Again, we don't even know what this story is going to be or anything like that. But add Scarlett Johansson, it's like adding ninjas. It just works. Anyway... <laughs> What do you think about the, uh, are you surprised to hear Scarlett Johansson? Do you like this fit? What do you think? Well, here's the thing. From a business standpoint, these movies pretty much, I mean, if you're going to be in a big franchise property, she could call her Avengers buddy, Chris Pratt, and go, was it fun to make these movies? And he probably right. said, yeah, pfft. you know, great payday, keeps making money. And I think another thing, and I have no evidence to back this up, but, you know, she married Colin Jost. If she wants to have a family, kids love dinosaurs. Oh, yes. And, you know, if you if I think being in one of these movies gives you cachet with your kids for the rest of your life, you know, because kids love not just dinosaurs, but people getting eaten by dinosaurs. <laughs> and that's what that's what these I, I, I mean, Scarlett Johansson with the where where the business is at. I mean, yeah, she's not probably looking to make her new ghost world, you know, ghost world Two. They don't have the kind of money. She's going to get a big payday, probably a nice annuity, you know, year after year with this. She's going to have a good time. They're going to make this movie fast because they have to. And David Kep wrote it, not a slouch in terms of a screenwriter, a lot of credits there. And I I, I see it's a win-win for her. It's a win-win for the studio and they're bring, they're they're building a new this is an all new uh I don't know what they're doing with it, but it's new. So there's a possibility of having maybe two more movies doing a trilogy. And uh I think for Scarlett Johansson everyone wins. Um, so here's an interesting thing to think about, though, too. By adding something like a Scarlett Johansson, I think that not only means you got a big A-list star, but it also becomes a magnet for other talent. Yep. I think when you attach somebody like her to it, when you're in negotiations now with other talent, you can swing a little bit you know, you can climb a little bit higher up the ladder and go after certain people that maybe you thought you couldn't get involved with this, but now you're able to present to this other talent 
and hey, we got Scarlett Johansson because she's she is a name right now, Rob, that a lot of people still want to act with. Sure. So are you? Do you think we'll see other big names starting to get attached to this? Well, I think you make a great, a fantastic point, actually, and I think yes, I think because if she signed on, if you're if you're making a Jurassic Park movie, sure, the payday is going to be great, but you all you don't want to have fun. So I'm sure Scarlett Johansson, I wouldn't be surprised if she already has somebody she suggested to the studio to say, look, we've always wanted to do something fun together. I'll bet you that we see somebody that's going to be in this movie with her. That's a lot of fun. That makes us go, I want to go see that. I want to see the two of them having a literally being either having a romp with vamp, uh, dinosaurs or having dinosaurs romp all over them. So either way, I think it's a win-win. <laughs> now, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think she has like two Academy Award nominations She's a twice nominated, I, I believe, Academy Awards. She got, yeah, there it is. She's best performance uh, actress in a leading role for Marriage Story, which she, like, her and Adam Driver were so good in yeah. that. And then best supporting actress in uh, Jojo Rabbit, she was nominated for. Now, I saw somebody in the live chat say, well, she's probably not, doesn't get paid as much or isn't worth as much as a Margot Robbie. I disagree. <laughs> I, I think she, she I, I don't think, Scarlett Johansson just demands more than Margot Robbie. I think she probably gets paid significantly more than Margot Robbie. Because, yeah, Barbie is a huge, big hit. And Margot is fantastic. But Margot has a long string of films also that nobody went to go see. Right. Right? Uh, and this re a couple just recently. Whereas Scarlett Johansson has a more established name She's been a part of the biggest franchise in history with the MCU. And she has indie cred with movies like Ghost World. And her and, and stuff like that. She's got tons of indie cred. She's got multiple Academy Award nominations. Yeah, so I would say, yeah, Scarlett Johansson is probably a bigger salary you got to pay than even to a Margot Robbie. Plus, right this now. franchise, if you are Scarlett Johansson, you're stepping into this franchise because you're getting paid. Oh, yeah. They're, they, I mean, this is not a franchise. Well, it might work. It might not. And you know <laughs> no. they're not looking to sign her for a one-movie deal. Right. Like, you don't go after someone like Scarlett Johansson and a franchise like Jurassic. Like they're they're going to try to get her to sign a three-picture deal, and they're going to build around her. And her 100%. and a T-Rex, I mean, what's not to buy a ticket for? I mean, you're there. So, anyway, guys, question is for you. What do you think about this report? Apparently, Scarlett Johansson, it looks like she's going to be the lead of the new Jurassic World movies. Do you like it? I personally do a lot. Maybe it seems like a weird fit to you. Whatever you guys think, jump down to the comment section below and let us know your thoughts. All right, guys. With that all down, we're now going to move over and start taking your live comments and questions. But before we do, we're going to take a quick moment here and thank the sponsor of today's episode of the John Campy Show podcast, our friends at Miracle Made. Guys, we want to take a second to thank a sponsor of today's video, Miracle Made. Did you know that your temperature at night can have one of the greatest impacts on your sleep quality? If you wake up too hot or too cold, I highly recommend you check out Miracle Made's bed sheets. Inspired by NASA, Miracle Made uses silver infused fabrics and makes temperature regulating bedding so that you can sleep at the perfect temperature all night long. When they arrived at our house, my wife Anne loved the feel of them so much, she couldn't even wait for me to get home to put them on our bed. Miracle Made has self cleaning. These sheets are infused with silver that prevents up to 99.7 of bacterial growth leaving them to stay cleaner and fresh three times longer than other sheets. Miracle sheets also have incredible comfort and quality. Miracle sheets are luxuriously comfortable without the high price tag of other luxury brands and feel as nice, if not nicer, than sheets used by some five-star hotels. So go to TryMiracle, that's T-R-Y-M-I-R-A-C-L-E dot com slash Campia to try Miracle Made sheets today. And whether you're buying them for yourself or as a gift for a loved one, if you order today, you can save over 40% and if you use our promo code CAMPIA at checkout, you'll get three free towels and save an extra 20%. Miracle is so confident in their product, it's backed with a 30-day money-back guarantee. So if you aren't 100% satisfied, you will get a full refund. So upgrade your sleep with Miracle Made. Go to trymiracle.com slash CAMPIA and use the code CAMPIA to claim your free three-piece towel set and save over 40% off. Again, that's trymiracle.com slash CAMPIA to treat yourself. And thank you to our friends at Miracle Made for sponsoring today's episode of the John Campy Show podcast. All right, guys, with that all down, let's get on to the most important part of the show, which is you guys and what you have to say. Jonathan, what do we got up first? 
Okay, up first is uh, TJ Perry, who says, I was so let down by three-body problem. Started out very promising, but the awful dialogue, glaring holes, and some unlikable characters tanked it for me. You know, it's funny. This is the great example of the pure subjectivity of, of entertainment because I literally had people writing in an open mic yesterday that loved it. Yep. And I know you, like... I liked it very I, much. I thought you wouldn't like it because you liked the book and the original story so much, and I was really nervous about you going into it. I know you were nervous going into it, but you ended up really liking it. I really it. liked it, and they they went a lot further into the second book than I thought. But here's the thing. The three-body problem is not a book that is known for its rich characterization. Mm. It's it's It deals more with heady ideas, and I like kind of how they were able to have a kind of a core group of friends become sort of the main protagonists because this story gets insane. If they make seasons two and three... Um, I don't know about plot points. I thought the plot points were really well covered. They really, they really, they skewed close to the book. I mean, there's a lot of heady concepts there that I'm sure many people might not have grasped the first time out because I certainly didn't. I you finished know. the gentleman. Oh, how really, great was that? Really liked it. I get I, like I, I was. You and I were talking about. I mean, again, not on the same level as Last of Us, House of the Dragon, show. No, one. no, but it's not supposed but, to be. It's, no, you know. it's but it's really good, and I. You know, I got to get this thought out of my head because, like, when they were doing what we do in the shadows, the show, I was not interested because, like, it's just going to be a poor, cheap version of the movie, even though it still had Taika Waititi making it. Right. And I love that show. And then I thought the same thing because I love the Gentleman movie. And I Me thought, too. You know, this is just going to be a poor, cheap substitute for this wonderful movie that we really like. But I finished it, and it it's really good. It's really good, and it stuck the landing, like you were saying, that Theo James, that guy's a star. Yeah, you know, and, like, and it's it's classic Guy Ritchie. Classic Guy Ritchie. Oh, absolutely do- enjoyed it. All right, sorry about that. Got off sidetrack. What's next? All right, The Vegetable Addict says, for the next Star Wars film, not Disney Plus series, to succeed, what does Disney have to do to gain the upset fans' trust back again? Make a good movie. <laughs> I mean, I, I know people get tired of hearing me say that, but it is no more and no less complicated than that. Make a really good movie. You make something really good. I mean, what you can't worry about are the bottom-dwelling, mom's basement living, cousin-humping losers who are going to get upset if you put a woman or a black person in it. What you got to worry about are the fans who just watched Mandalorian Season 3 and just didn't like it or watch The Last Jedi and just on its own merits simply did not like it. Or like me, watch The Rise of Skywalker and just straight up didn't like it. Those are the people you got to worry about. You know, you don't don't worry about the the chuds. Don't worry about the chuds. I mean, the chuds are going to be the chuds. Doesn't matter what you do. Let them, you know, go sniff each other's asses in the corner. Doesn't matter. But you got to worry about the people who just straight up didn't like the product because they didn't think the product was very good quality. And... If you just make something really good, solid, I don't care what, it, it won't matter, Rob, if it happens in the old republic, the high republic, the new republic, it, it won't matter. It won't matter if it focuses on Jedi or rebels. It won't matter if it's a political intrigue or a high action Jedi adventure. If you make it solid and tell just tell a great story and get, that will start the process. That will get people on board. I and anybody out there who thinks no 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 it's a part of a formula if you just do old republic and everybody will be happy no they won't you do old republic and make it the same quality as the rise of skywalker it ain't going to make anybody happy so it it is no more rob to me no more no less complicated than just making a really good movie I agree and you know don't here's the thing this seems counterproductive but when you're making a great star wars movie forget it's a star wars movie yeah. Take all the Star Wars out of it. Yep. Because the original Star Wars, Lucas was looking at Kurosawa. He was looking at Joseph Campbell, the man with the thousand or the hero with a thousand faces. I mean, it was about family. It was about redemption. It was about a, a, a kid who sees, he looks out the horizon at the twin, twin setting sons of Tatooine wondering, is this all that I am? Can I get off this moisture farm? What, what's, what, what's out there for me? There was something else going on. Now Star Wars is up its own Star Wars ass. Take the Star Wars out of it. Get rid of, of all the iconography and tell us a story about people that we as an audience, audience we were all Luke Skywalker in that moment. When we heard the French horn of John Williams, we saw all of us looked out, look to the future. 
you know what? Andor did it. Andor did it. Andor did it in Because it was about people. Yeah. You know, it, Mon Mothma was in a tough spot. We could look at that and go, that was not a Star Wars spot to be in. That was any states person that's dealt with intrigue and war and all that. I mean, you might as well have been watching something that was happening in Winston Churchill's Britain in two thousand or World War II. That's why it was good. And Skarsgård gives like one of the best monologues in Star Wars history. Well, Luthen is a great Star oh, Wars character. Such a great and, fantastic. And there's, and there's so much we still don't know about him. But that whole thing when he gives that speech, the du- that that dude, I can't remember the the line now. He says. Like I burned my life so that others can see, so others a can sunset enjoy sunset that, that I'll never, I'll never see, see or something. Yeah, like that whole. I don't know how that moment didn't win like all the Emmys. Like just on that, like it's, oh god, that show's so good, not so good. Mention, not to mention like the Rise Up speech, when you know when she's like the hologram at the oh end. yeah at the, at the funeral and yeah, stuff like up. that. I mean, it's just they just you're so right. They just okay. Put Star Wars aside for a second. Can we tell a can we make rich characters tell a compelling story? with great tension and intrigue and excitement. And they did that and they put it in the context of Star Wars and they just, oh. And then they did Obi-Wan and Ahsoka and Mandalorian season three. And you know, uh, they've, they've, this is the part that, it always frustrates me, Rob, so much, whether it's an actor, a director, a studio, a franchise, whatever, when if somebody turns in mediocrity and that's all they've ever done, and you know that's the best they can do, right? You're like, okay, that's what it is. You don't get frustrated with it because that's the. It frustrates me when you see an actor who you know you've seen them give world class performances, and then you see them kind of mail one in, and it frustrates you because you know they're better than that. What really frustrates me about Star Wars lately is the fact that, in the midst of all the crap, every once in a while, something like an Andor. Or something like a Mandalorian season one and two. You know, they these things come out that tell you, see, they're capable of doing better. They just keep drop. They just keep tripping over their own nutsack and and falling on their faces. And uh, well, that's and, frustrating. And they make things. You know, if you're telling an Obi Wan story, why do you have to have Princess Leia in it? You know, tell us a story about where Obi-Wan is and make it universal in terms of if a man has been disgraced and his order is destroyed and the government he supported for so long is gone, tell us that story. That's a universal story. Now, it's already in the Star Wars universe. You already have Ewan McGregor, who's a great actor. So why forget that it's a Star Wars tale and tell the human tale that we can all relate to? The Star Wars will take care of itself. All right. What's next? We got... Kyle Schneider, who writes, uh, Regal is playing Chinatown. Oh, nice. Jake, it's Chinatown on Wednesday. So a buddy and I are going to see that. And then uh, Godzilla and Kong on Friday. Hope Godzilla Kong has fun action at the very least. I think you'll get that for sure. Somebody was writing in yesterday. They were a little concerned that we haven't seen um, reviews Mm -hmm. yet for it. But fear not. Because tomorrow morning, we're going to be talking about the first reactions for Godzilla X Kong. The, the embargo for, for, for social media reactions to Godzilla X Kong drops at 10.30 p.m. tonight. So um, starting tonight, they're going to start to drop. So tomorrow morning, we'll be talking about the first reactions to Godzilla X Kong. And I, I'm i getting kind of excited to see it, man. I'm giddy. I'm, I'm, I'm stoked to see it. All right. What's next? All right. We got Suthius who says, uh, episode four of Shogun, not nah, episode five of Three Body Problem. Holy moly. Uh, Jesus, very interesting show indeed. <laughs> it, I'll, I'll look. I'm gonna be honest with you. I've had people writing and say they really like the show. You say you love the show. The trailers have done nothing to interest me. You mean three body problem? Trailers. Three body problem. Yeah. What did I say? No, I, you yeah, did say. Yeah, I was talking just, about three body problem. The because you mentioned the show is very head heady. That the book is very heady, and the the trailers they've done for it have not hinted to me at all what's the story of this thing right the trailer just looks like it's weird and it has not appealed to my curiosity to run out and check it out if if you had a 15 or 30 second elevator pitch to give to an average viewer about why they should check out three body problem what would you say to them because it's a story about how earth is going to deal with a much more superior alien race showing up in 400 years to do something to Mm. us and we don't know what that is 
See, if the trailers told me that, I probably would have got more interested in it. Yeah, I mean, I think they don't want to reduce it to that, but you asked the quick elevator pitch, and I think if a lot of people understood that it's about an alien race that discovers that we exist and decides they want our planet, but they're not going to be here for 400 years because that's how long it takes for it them takes to time come. To get there. And how does Earth know that they're coming and then how does Earth prepare for them? Prepare for that. And and they're also messing with us in a way that they were able to do. They're screwing around with humanity, oh, which they can. And it's really interesting. All right. Sounds like uh, my ex-girlfriend. All right. What's next? Uh, Raph from State Farm says, was skepti skeptical at first, but three-body problem is great. Why yeah. Again, today? we heard somebody from the beginning who didn't like it. Heard a couple people who really like it. I, I'm going to be curious to check it out. All right. What's next? All right. Uh, Matan says... Uh, have you seen the cringy trend of TikTokers clowning on cinephiles who say their favorite films are three hours um, art films? Never seen more disrespect uh, for cinema since all of the Marvel fans that tried <laughs> to bring Scorsese down. Uh, no. No. I guess my response would be, who cares? <laughs> uh, is there anything sadder than people trying to take advantage of a TikTok trend? You know, if somebody's trying to bring uh, uh, more attention to three-hour art films, I'm all for it. <laughs> all for it. <laughs> bring it on. All right. What's next? Uh, Amin says, best theater experience of the 2020 so far, Dune 2, Avatar 2, Maverick, Oppenheimer, Across the Spider-Verse, No Way Home, Dune 1, uh, Dead Reckoning, anything you would add or remove? I don't know. I'd have to think about the the dates. I'd have to sit down and look at a list of films that have come out in the last you know four or five years. Um you know, Madam great... Webb's got to be on there. <laughs> Madam Webb's got to be on there. A great theater experience. Like a, a lot of, I'm not saying you're doing this, by the way. I'm saying a lot of people, when you ask them about great theater experiences they have, all they really then say is what their favorite movies are of the, that past time period, right? To me, a great movie theater experience goes beyond just whether the movie was great or not. It, it, it involves the theater you're in, the people you're with um the 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 context in which you saw like all that kind of stuff comes in plays like one of my all-time favorite theater experiences was seeing the first avengers movie yes i i think the first avengers movie is is not a top five greatest film of all time for me but it's it's a top greatest comic book film of all time for me but that's not what made it one of my top two or three favorite movie going experiences it was a combination of the movie being incredibly fun but i was also in a theater with it was a press screening with a lot of jaded press people who weren't buying into yet this whole comic this new trend this new comic book movie trend that was coming about and a lot of people went in going hmm like show me yeah, right whatever right and then watching this jaded group who probably a lot of them went in there just looking for things to, that they don't like buzzing in the theater and giggling in a way they probably didn't giggle or laugh or enjoy themselves in a movie in a long time. And by the end, by the time you get halfway through the third act, these jaded, crotchety, whatever, hooting and hollering and yelling. At, like, it felt like we were at a fan screening and not a press screening. And then, you know, then the Hulk scene happens. Hulk smash and he's just beating the shit out of everything. He's like, this is the Hulk we've always been waiting for our whole life. And just... That combined with then coming out of the theater and everybody just shaking, like everybody just being hopped up. Like it's all that stuff with a great movie that makes a great theater experience. So like for me, things like that first screening of Avengers or um, being at the world premiere of, even though the movie is what it is, but being at the world premiere of The Force Awakens, you know, because I got to be in the Chinese theater. Yeah where decades ago in this very spot the original star wars had its debut and i'm sitting like literally three rows and two seats away from george lucas and steven spielberg and like just like the history of that so like to me that's my favorite like movie going experience do you have like any last few years that really well to you? it wasn't really the last few years but it's relevant this week godzilla final wars also opened at the chinese theater <laughs> And this was supposed to be the last Toho Godzilla movie, and they brought the cast. And uh, the female cast were all wearing traditional Japanese kimonos and stuff. And John, being in that theater was like being at a WWF event. 
<laughs> we were all Godzilla, f and you know they, he fought all these different monsters. He even fights Godzilla fights the Roland Emmerich CG Godzilla. So you had a man in the suit Godzilla fighting a CG Godzilla <laughs> in Australia. And, That's so and meta. <laughs> you had the alien controller, and and when the CG Godzilla gets defeated, the controller's like. I knew that salmon eating iguana was good for nothing. You know, and everyone's screaming. And the Japanese cast, like these these women, were like, what is going, what is with these Americans? We were screaming and yelling. And when, when the movie was over, the thunderous applause. And these, these Japanese actors are getting up going, these Americans are nuts. They're out of their minds. And they didn't understand that. Godzilla's this was fun you know for us we're a bunch of nerds and it was it was just hilarious to be there and you know I would say seeing Infinity War it wasn't 2020s but with Schnepp yeah you know I will never forget I was with Amy Dallin and Schnepp and I think Koi I think was there when you hear the Hugo weaving sound alike and it was Red Skull oh you I know? remember my jaw dropped in my lap John Schnepp turned to we both turned to each other like at the same time, and it was like we were four year olds going, <laughs> and, and 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 it was I mean that was the last movie I saw with him, and it was that was an incredible experience. I saw it at the at the uh, um, El Capitan that morning screening with all the nerds, all of our people. <laughs> all right, what's fantastic. Next? Lipstick train face says three pot body problem was great. More people writing in saying they're enjoying. That's great. All David, right, what's next? David Aaron says I've seen some pretty bad Dune takes, but today I saw the worst. Timothy Chalamet just plays himself in every movie. Oh my I god! I get all the film is subjective, but I gotta believe some people are just contrarians. Of course there are. Like, listen, because all art is subjective, you can have the greatest the, a movie you think is the greatest movie in the world. There are gonna be people who just legitimately don't like it, and that's fair. But then there are some who kind of tip their hand and they they're just trying to be shit disturbers and whatever. So, I mean, but hey, look, and maybe that's somebody who legitimately, whatever reason, it, it hits them a certain way that they think Timothy Chalamet is like, really? You did just see Wonka. I was going to say. And Dune 2 back to back, right? I, I, I mean, whatever. That's pretty, there's a lot of range there. Yeah, there's a lot of range in there. Anyway, okay, what's next? Uh, we got Spooky Castle Productions. Uh, if the Acolyte is well received, do you be, uh, believe we will see more from the High Republic era outside of books and comics? Well, th th it will depend. Like, being well received isn't the issue. Is it well received because it's New Era Republic? You know, um, I so I don't I don't know. It it really depends on if it's well received. Which I'm I'm losing faith in the project. Yeah, I've been super hyped for it for years. But just the things I'm seeing and hearing, uh, the, the episode run times and all that kind of stuff, I'm I'm kind of losing some some of my enthusiasm for it right now. We'll see what happens. It turns out, but that's like saying, you know, if it if it turns out great and it's well received, and there's you know a, a main character in it with wearing dreads, do we think we'll see more Star Wars movies with people with dreads? Or I mean, so it's it. <sighs> It's dangerous to play the game of trying to cherry pick out elements of something that worked or didn't work and say it worked or did not work because of that one thing. So I, I don't know. Anything's possible. Look, we know Lucasfilm want, wanted a couple of years ago. They really wanted to move into the era of the High Republic. But, you know, the stories of the books weren't all that greatly received. One of the books was actually pretty good, but the, the overall the books weren't all that greatly received. So I don't know. We'll we'll see. We'll see. All right. What's next? Seconds from Disaster says, someone mentioned on open mic, Jack Black technically isn't in the foreign overdub version of Kung Fu Panda uh, for how would that affect residuals? That is a, yeah. So somebody brought up when I was doing open mic yesterday that Jack Black was talking about how it was weird going to China to do press for Kung Fu Panda 4 when he's not even in the movie in China because right. he got a, a Chinese actor doing the dub of, uh, of Poe. And I thought, you know, that's that is really weird that you'd have him still over there doing the the press. So how would that affect residuals? That's a very good question. My guess would be, and this is just a guess, but my guess would be anything from international markets that his voice is not in. Because there's a lot of international markets that the movie's still playing in English. Yeah. But there are going to be some international markets that it's going to be playing only in the foreign language. My guess would be he won't get residuals from that. By the, the only... way, he won't mm -hmm. be getting residuals from them anyway because it all depends on whether or not he has points in his contract. He might just have a straight-up salary. Yeah. A right. lot of people got to remember, most actors don't have points on movies. But uh, you know, residuals will then normally come from when it gets 
played on television, on network TV, or if it goes to streaming or stuff like that, that's where residuals come in. What you're talking about is actors who have in their contracts have points on the film. My guess would be he will get no box office points from from markets that he's not even in the movie. I don't know, Rob, what do you but think? But I think, I think, though, that the movie itself, because the franchise is kind of his franchise in terms of, like, there might be, he might get box off performance bumps. So if the movie overall, not it doesn't matter where it came from, but if the movie made, say, a billion dollars, he might have, uh, in his salary, if, if the movie makes $200 million, he gets a bump. If it makes $500 million, he gets a bump. So the movie itself, as a business concern, his involvement in it overall helps it no matter what it does worldwide. Because that's probably taken into consideration when he makes his deal, right. I would so assume. So essentially, we don't know. Yeah. Because like, yeah. we don't know what is or is not in his contract. We can speculate about what he could have in his contract, but we don't know. It could also just be a straight, you know, pay for hire. I mean, it because could be, you know, I'll, I'll be in this movie for $7 million, and that could just be it. Lots of movies are dubbed in foreign countries. In Germany, they dub most movies, for instance. Now, they might release a subtitled version and a dubbed version. But in most of those, you'll still see the actor performing. That's true. And something like Kung Fu Panda 4, you don't see Jack Black and... In China, you're not going to hear Jack Black mm, either. Yeah. It's not no, like it was stop motion. Absolutely. Not stop motion. But, motion capture. Yeah, so. it's not like he was doing the motion uh, Yeah, I'd be curious. Either. Now I want to know the answer to this. Yeah, I would love I, that's to, a I very, very good how question. How would that work? However, he does have a song cover of Hit Me Baby One More Time. On the red carpet? So they may have, yes. Yeah, well, you know, so there is still involvement with him that yeah. he's singing that song. Yes. And he probably gets residuals off of that song. Well, so well no, because it's not Spears. his song. He can't get residuals off that song. Uh, I think you still get paid, but she gets a cut because she'll they're because they're it's cover. They get yeah, they're allowing it to cover officially. Yeah. I anyway, yeah. the bottom line is we don't know. Like because we, we don't know what's in his contract. That's a really interesting it? question. That's I want to know the answer to that question. now. All right, what's next? Uh Nelson Alfaro, yes. Had uh Jack Ryan in the for, had Jack Ryan in the Forgotten Corner, just finished season three. What a great uh espionage show. You know, we talked about this before. I was really into Jack Ryan. The uh, John Krasinski Amazon version. Yep. And then they got to the season where they did the th part that every single spy and espionage story eventually, it doesn't matter if it's 24, it doesn't matter if it's born, where, oh no, our hero is now mm -hmm. on the run because our own government thinks they're the bad guy. And I remember I just saw the previews for it and they're doing that. I'm like, really? They're doing that with Jack Ryan too? And I just lost interest, and I didn't watch it anymore after that. Even I, I didn't even tune in because just I knew they were doing this tired trope of at some point the government turns against our hero and the hero's on the run trying to stop the bad guy and clear their name at the same time. And it's like I, I've I've seen this dance before. I and I and even though I was really liking the show, I got turned off and I didn't keep watching it. But you, did you finish it out? Did you finish the series? Yeah. I mean, uh, I liked it, you know, but again, I thought the first season was the strongest, you know, and they kept oh, bringing, it was great. They kept bringing in elements of the movies, like s plot points, like clear and present danger and things like that. And I just, but I liked it. John Krasinski was a good Jack Ryan and I, I enjoyed it. It was a, a well, slickly, well produced, slickly made show. So I enjoyed, I agree with our viewer that it was good. I mean, I'm just a Tom Clancy fan. So it was fun to watch. Mm -hmm. All right. What's next? Mr. Godzilla says, hey, guys, was curious, uh, what was a movie that had amazing marketing that you ended up disliking or being bad? And what was a poor marketed movie that ended up being amazing? I mean, that's I, I, we could talk about that all day. Yeah. <laughs> so like the poster child for me, two poster children for me of like horribly marketed movies that were great. John Carter, Blade Runner 2049 <laughs> um, were two brutally horribly botched marketing campaigns horrible like they killed the movies um so there's that as far as great marketed movies oh we've seen we see tons of those every single year i, I you don't have to go any farther than the transformers franchise i mean the tra <laughs> every, i mean i was like the poor sap i'm trying to think of the movie example of like the guy you know what when it comes to transformers movie Michael Bay was Lucy holding the football and I was Charlie Brown. <laughs> Every time 
thinking this time they're going to hold the ball in place and I'm going to kick it. Because even though I like the first Transformers movie, every Transformers movie af- after that, up until we got to um, Bumblebee, was hot steaming garbage. But every time I would get so excited because they would make these killer trailers for Transformers and I would go and kick and Michael Bay would pull the ball away. Our viewer Emilio Escobar has a good one. Edge of Tomorrow. Oh, that is that is a great one. Dude, that's, that tomorrow. goes right up there with the poster children. Like, yes. wow. What, how, I, that to me, a I don't know how they watched. By the way, that was directed by Doug Lyman. Did yep. you watch Roadhouse? I did. I enjoyed it. I, I just thought, um, I thought. Was it $85 million worth of enjoyment, no. though? I, I Listen, when wow. it comes to watching a movie, I do not care what the budget was. I, unless we're talking about a, a visual effects heavy movie, sure. I don't care about the budget was. Um, like Joker two has a two hundred million dollar budget. I know why, uh, but but I don't care about that. All I care about was I watched the movie. I thought it was quite entertaining, other than how bad Conor McGregor is in it. But although even though he's bad in it, his action stuff was fantastic. He brought all the physicality to it. Just every time he had to open his mouth, I I wanted to die a little bit inside uh but i enjoyed the movie you didn't you clearly didn't i i was not a fan i got a kick out of it i was not a fan but i watched it um the post credit <laughs> scene was also pretty funny i i gotta admit i like the post credit scene it was pretty funny all right what's next oh well speaking of jay enjoyed roadhouse but i don't understand the connor hate it's his first movie i mean he read the lines better than madam webcast did no he didn't <laughs> yeah no he didn't the Madam Webcast read their lines better than, Hey, fellas! Oh, when Knox is on the job, it's over, baby! He had one button. And and that was it. Um, every time he, again, every time he opened his mouth, I wanted to die a little bit inside. Now, again, that being said, when it came to time for the most important reasons that Conor McGregor was there, bring the physicality, he brought the physicality. And there are two marquee fights between Conor McGregor and uh, Jake Gyllenhaal in it. And both the fights were great. They're I, great. I, yeah, I love the fights. And absolutely, Conor did a great job. But every time he opened his mouth, all right, then, God bless. It, it just, I, I wanted to gouge out my ears. Like, it was just that, <laughs> that bad. But I, but like you, I enjoyed the film. I thought overall was still, I thought Jake Gyllenhaal I mean, was I didn't a great hate Dalton. It. You know it what? It was just predictable. You knew where it was going. There's nothing else. Hundred percent. I didn't like the way it was shot. Do you know what I really, what really bothered me about it the most? What's this that? is going to seem so weird. That bar, the Roadhouse itself, right. was awesome. Mm. The location was awesome. The building was awesome. It's right on the beach, and I'm like, nobody would go to this place and be a dick. It was such a nice place that people would go there and hang out, Rob, and it would have brought everybody there. It was in Florida. <laughs> yeah, it is in Florida. I mean, in the keys too. I mean, that would have been that would have been a destination spot for all kinds of people. And they made it look it was not a dive place. And I'm like, this doesn't make any sense to me. But remember, <laughs> before the movie starts though, for months there had been an active campaign to make it a a rough Right, broken down thing, and it took them a while to get. <laughs> I, By the way, sixty one percent the critic rating on it, so not great, not terrible. No, uh, it it was what it was. I mean, uh, it gave me. You know, I never the the gr- first movie was a, a masterpiece. Oh, I enjoyed I loved watching the it. first movie. Yeah, Everyone loves the first movie. <laughs> you know what they? There were a couple things. There were a couple things missing from this movie that I would have liked to have seen. Be nice, should should have been a part of it. But a version of the Sam Elliott character. Right. Right. They now I I get why they took it out. Like because they, they you know the movie they they only wanted the movie to be so long and whatever. So they took that character out. I thought that would have been an interesting thing if he had run into a to a I don't know like an older MMA coach of his or something like that. Like a Randy Couture from <laughs> right. former UFC heavyweight champion, and he's in all the Expendable movies. Like maybe he could have been like a Sam Elliott kind of character. But whatever, you know, it was what it was. All right, what's next? Uh, Guzman says, ScarJo is taking dinosaur jobs now. Shame. <laughs> that, that is a good joke because it goes back to when she was going to play the transvestite character, yep. which I've just, that's hilarious. All right, what's next? Jay Loco says, John, heed my words. If Beetlejuice 2 is a success for WB and Keaton, then 
the probability of an Elseworld bat. Oh my God. <laughs> Listen, I want this to happen too, but you guys are putting us through so much yeah. distress here. No, Batman, Batman Beyond, Beyond for Life is 40%, BBC for Life. <laughs> what does Beetlejuice have to do with Batman Beyond? Michael Keaton. What does Beetlejuice have to do with Batman Beyond? Not well, it's got to make him a star again. They've already moved. Warner Brothers already moved past that. They're not. You're not going to see Michael Keaton <laughs> as Batman. Guess what? We just had Michael Keaton as Batman, and nobody went to go see them twice. Movie. Yep. And one of them we didn't one, even one get One of the to movies see. got shelved, and the other one nobody went to go see. No, Warner Brothers is not interested in bringing. I am interested in seeing more Michael Keaton. I thought Michael Keaton as Batman in the Flash movie was great. I want to see his movie that he directed. Knox, it's called like Knox. Knox, Knox returns. Dis, Knox or, goes away. Knox goes, goes away. away. Knox goes away. Where he he's like losing his. He directed that. I didn't know he directed yeah. that. That does look good. It I looks like, good. That look, one looks interesting. Yeah. All right, what's next? Uh, we got Bruce Wayne Brady. Hey Robert, do you uh, own any X Plus Godzilla figures? <sighs> oh boy, I had one, one that was very expensive, and it was two parts. It was Godzilla and Ghidorah. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Is that one of the ones that went missing from your storage locker? No. Okay. That is, uh, is that one you just sold? That or? met an accident. Oh, that's because the they're, 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 the X plus stuff is it's done in like um um uh oh, it's called like not sandstone but it, it it it's it's fragile. It does not survive being dropped. Oh, like babies. Hmm. Yeah, got to be careful with him. And I had an X-Plus Rodan, too. And I got I actually sold that to a friend. But the X-Plus Godzilla stuff is great. But these are back circa 2005, 2006. All right, what's next? Uh, we got, uh, TG, uh, no, Seconds from Disaster. I saw the 2014 Godzilla in IMAX and was in complete awe seeing him come to on screen for the first time that huge. So I had to get IMAX tickets for this Friday. Is that the Brian Cranston one? Yes. Yes. The the Godzilla movie that really didn't yeah. have any Godzilla in it. <laughs> Cutaways. Yeah. Yeah. It's like okay, Godzilla's about to fight a monster, and let's go to the apartment across the country, mm. and uh, catch up to see what uh, at the end freaking kick ass yeah. is doing in his apartment, talking with his <laughs> wife. Uh, like, uh, all right, what's the next? T.J. Perry says late night with the devil earned that ninety plus Rotten Tomatoes rating. David uh, Desmalkian. Polka Dot Man is great, and I loved the 70s style Go Shutter. Dude, it's so good. Oh, you watched it? Yeah. What's Let's the basic the What's the basic premise of the movie? The, so the, it's there's a late night talk show in the in the 70s, and there the, and it's it's done like it's a real talk show, but you see like the behind the scenes too. So you see the broad. It's like you're watching the whole broadcast. And let's just say that they bring a character on who may or may not be the devil, be possessed. And, but it's done, it's played straight as if it's real. It, and David Dismalchin is, he's great. And everything is great in it. It's so well done. It's so well done. All right. And by the way. And where can you watch it? Is it just it's on the, it was, it opened, it's Theatrically too, it was IFC's largest theatrical opening ever. And it's a, a film, one of the people responsible was a friend of the channel, uh, producer Roy Lee, who's having a big week. Because he's a producer on Godzilla, and one of the first films that he brought to America to remake from Asia, The Ring, was released last week by Scream Factory in 4K. Well, I'm on uh, box office right now, and you can bring this up. So, Late Night with the Devil came in sixth. Sixth. With made two point eight million dollars for a Shutter production. And well, and that's IFC too, and that's their largest theatrical opening ever. And, and by the way, Doom Part 2, remember last week I said I think Doom Part 2 will hopscotch this week. Kung Fu How Panda many 4. theaters was late? I can't, you're, 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 that's covering, oh, yeah, only in a thousand, thousand theaters, theaters too. Yeah. Not bad. Not bad. All right, what's next? We got Ray Loves Trench Coats. Catch <laughs> up on eggs or go to Disneyland again on your dime. <laughs> you probably just go to Disneyland again. Catch up know. on eggs before I go to Disneyland again. All right, I'm going to cook them up. Here's the thing. Can I tell you the story? Nobody cares, but I'm going to tell it anyway because it's my fucking show. So you're gonna, all going to have to indulge me. So I made the decision as a husband that the most important thing in my life is making my wife happy. I, I want my wife to enjoy her life as much as she can. And so that is my number one priority in life, taking care of, supporting, and doing everything I can for my wife to make her happy. That's my job as a husband. My wife loves going to Disneyland. 
And it, I could see it every time she would go with friends. It would make her pretty sad that I would not go because I have not gone to Disneyland for years because fuck Disneyland. <laughs> that fucking scam. <laughs> anyway. So I finally, I feel pretty bad about it one day. I'm like, you know what? My job as a husband is to help you. So you know what? If it would make you happy, me going, I'm going to go with you to Disneyland. I'm this was go. just recently. Yep. <clears throat> so it's a true story. I'm not proud of this. <laughs> this is true. I said, well, you know what? At least there's the Indiana Jones ride, which I legitimately love. And at least there's the Blue Bayou, which is the best restaurant on the Disney property. I love it. It's kind of, it's like a, 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 um, a, a down in the bayou kind of atmosphere. You're right on the Pirates of the Caribbean ride that the people in the boats are going right by you and great ambiance, great. And I'm thinking, you know what? At least it's got that. So, okay, let's go. So we go and we're driving there. Say, so let's make reservations for the restaurant. It says, oh, it doesn't take reservations. Like all the other restaurants, you can make a reservation. Wouldn't let you make a reservation for Blue Bayou. All right. My mouth's water. I'm thinking about the food I'm going to have there. We get to the park. We walk all the way through. We get there. And we get there at about 11 a.m. And say, can we put our name in? She's like, I'm sorry. We're already booked for the day. I'm like, all right. All right. So um, can we make reservations or something? Four to six weeks out. I had spent a day getting myself psyched up for going to this godforsaken pit known as Disneyland <laughs> filled with mouse shit everywhere. Just talking about, and then the whole drive to Anaheim, which isn't that far, only about a half hour for us, drive to Anaheim, talking to myself, at least I'm going to be able to get to go to this restaurant. And we, we get there, we park, we walk 20 minutes, get to the place, and then all that kind of stuff to be told, eh, eh no. And I... <laughs> With children around, I'm like, fuck this place. Fuck this whole scam of the devil's asshole. Of did This whole place is a total scam. And my wife is like, John, there are kids around. I'm like, oh, shit, that's right. There are kids around. But I'm like, I was so mad. I was so mad. Anyway, yeah, fuck Disneyland. They're a bunch of assholes. Anyway, there's that. <laughs> fuck them. Fuck them. Fuck Disneyland. So fuck, go to Universal Studios. Much better bang for your buck much better value. They actually care about people who go in there. Fuck the mouse. All right. <laughs> What's next? Uh, Marie Reich says, isn't Disneyland great? No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> the number one box office that stars Timothy Chalamet is Interstellar at 733. Uh, can Dune 2 surpass that? I think so. The number one box... Oh, sorry, try that so again. So he was in Interstellar? I don't remember him. He's, 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 a he's, uh, is he the kid? He's a kid. He's the son. I didn't even realize young, he's that. He's young Murph. I mean, young Murph's brother. Yeah. I did not even know that. <laughs> Um, I don't think so. Look, I, I said from the beginning, I, when people are saying, oh, Dune 2 can make a million. I'm like, no, it's, it just doesn't have the broad enough popcorn appeal. I said between six and seven. I think that's where I ended up six and seven. And I think it's, it's about to cross. I think this week it'll cross 600 million. I don't see it getting to 733. I mean, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't, but the movie only needed to make about 450 million to break even. So it's already super profitable for them. But I, I, I mean, it can Get to 733, my guess is it won't, but I don't know. What do you think? It could. I mean, I it depends how long. It, it could have longevity. You know, people want to keep going back and seeing it. If Godzilla versus Kong... It's number does, two at Godzilla, the box office again. Yeah, if Godzilla x Kong isn't great and people want to have a better experience, they'll go back. I mean, it's got legs. If you look at the percentage of, of what it's dropped, it's its hold has like been 30% in the 30s as opposed to 40s or 50s. So it's got some hold there, and it could it could stick around for a while. All right, what's next? We got Jake Clark who says, please watch Psych. It's one of the best, funniest, most underrated TV comedies ever. I, I don't know why people keep writing in to say that. I, I, maybe someday I'll get around to it, but it's not high on my priority list. I keep I keep hearing good things about it, but I've got so many other current things that it's very difficult for me to keep up with. Like, I haven't even started watching Three Body Problem. Like I, So I'm not going to sacrifice watching new things so I can go back and watch an old thing. like right, like right So it, it took me a few days just to get caught up on The Gentleman. I got to get on to Three Body Problems. I'm, I'm trying to keep up, too. We got you got to give Three Shogun. Body three episodes, by the yeah. way. We it got the new slow. Shogun comes out tonight. I, I know. Mean, all that kind of stuff. So 
All right, what's next? Mr. Godzilla's back, says, not a hater of the Jurassic World films, but to be honest, as a dinosaur fan, I want more dinosaurs or dinosaur films not connected to the franchise, i.e. Uh, ERB's The Lost World. What's that? ERB. Hmm. Uh, yeah, we always encourage people, don't write in acronyms because we may not know what we're talking about. Um, it, it's hard, though, for Hollywood to do like other dinosaur things because Jurassic World is out there, right? And so you run the risk of either just being called a Jurassic Park copycat or you're going to be compared to it and your success or lack thereof is going to be compared to it. So it makes it challenging. You know, the dinosaur thing that was out not long ago was that Stephen Lang Fox series where the people traveled through a portal back in time because the current Earth isn't as habitable and they went back in time. What was the name of that? Does anybody Terra remember? Nova. Terra Nova. That was it. I actually liked it, but then it got canceled, I think, after the first or second. And then there's La Brea. I still have not watched a single episode of La Brea. I've watched that show. <laughs> is, is, is it good? Is it bad? I watched the first season. I wouldn't say it was It was no manifest. It did not it have the no entertainment manifest. value that manifest has. <laughs> All right. What's next? Uh, the Family Art House says Netflix's version of the three-body problem isn't that bad. Uh, F the Xantis humanity first. Is that the alien race? The Zan no, the Santi or the, the, Santee, and, the and, 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 which which in the in the American translation, the English translation, they're called the Trisolarans, but that's a but in the original book they're called the Santi. So like the Trilams, the Trilams, <laughs> the lambda lambda lambdas. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. What's next? Uh, oh, let me uh, move this up a little bit. Uh, CLS Rock says, hey, guys, um, where can the next Transformers movie go? They hinted at a crossover with G.I. Joe. Do you see that being a positive uh, direction and generating some hype? Their comics are doing quite well these days ever since Robert Kirkman's company took over. I, I don't think there is going to be another one. Yeah. Um, Rise of the Beasts. Listen, I didn't. I personally didn't mind Rise of the Beasts. No, it was it, fun. It, it, it wasn't bad. It was nowhere near as good as Bumblebee was. And they really should have made another Bumblebee movie. It made $438 million at the box office, which means I'm not sure if it made money or not. It depends how much it cost. Yeah, what was the production? Let's actually look at um, uh, Transformers uh, Rise of the There's no Dark the Moon. Beast production budget. Um, $200 million. Mm. So you're probably looking about with the marketing costs and stuff like that, and then the theatrical cut, you're probably talking about four hundred and fifty million needed to break even. It's same thing as uh, Dune Two. Uh, so it probably lost money. It lost the momentum that the first Bumblebee movie got generated for it. They made a horrible mistake not making Bumblebee Two. Like they made a horrible mistake not locking down Travis Knight and making Bumblebee Two within three years that Bumblebee came out because. Although Bumblebee itself didn't make a ton of money, that's because the Transformers franchise had been run into the ground and nobody believed in it anymore. Then they made Bumblebee, and suddenly they made something that everybody was really enjoying, and then they went back to making Transformers movies, which kind of, instead of making people feel nostalgic for the Bumblebee movie that came out a few years ago, it made them think about the trash Transformers movies that came out. And I'll be honest with you, I, I don't think this G.I. Joe Transformers movie is going to happen. I, I think they're all, they wanted to make at least five fifty six hundred million dollars on this, and it probably ended up losing a little bit of money. So I don't think it's going to happen. All right, what's next? Christopher hmm. Baker asks, "Do you think we'll see a Baby Yoda as an adult in future Star Wars?" No, I feel like he's supposed to be doomed. Yeah, yeah, I think I think that uh, that thing dies. <laughs> I think that little uh, that little Kermit the Frog reject dies at some point. I love baby Yoda. Calm down. Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't know. I don't think we're going to see it as an adult. I, I mean, I, I don't, by the way, I have no insider information that he's not. Nobody's told me that we're not ever going to do it. I just, you're asking me my guess, and my guess is I don't think we're going to see an adult. Grogu, what do you think? I don't think so either, because aren't we leading up to the sequel trilogy? I mean, it's all that post, I mean, isn't that what I mean, this is still like 15 years before the before, sequel trilogy. Yeah, but yeah, I mean, but, he's not in that. Nope, nowhere to be seen. <laughs> so, and the First Order rises, something bad's going to yeah, happen. Something bad happens to that frog. All right, what's next? <laughs> um, Wesley Cunningham says, was thinking about it, and where's George Clooney been acting-wise? Been in like two movies since Hail Caesar. 
pretty much fully transitioned to behind the camera. Well, he was what? in that Julia Roberts rom com that did really well. Which the one? holiday when they went on holiday, you know, Return to Paradise or whatever it was called. Oh, that's right, where they had the daughter. Yeah, right. And, there and was they, that. Yeah, the marriage one, and and that movie did pretty well. And he's got the one with Brad Pitt. And he just directed um, the Boys in the Boat. That was about right. the the rowing team that. Well, that's what he's saying. He's, he's seen, he was saying yeah. that it seems like he's working more behind the scenes, but he'll be in Wolves. And isn't um, he's got the Brad Pitt when they play yeah, Assassins? Right, that's being directed by the Spider Man director. Uh, isn't John Watt directing that? Or am I thinking of something else? Uh, I've no. got to hear John Watts. Yeah, John Watts is yeah. So the Spider Man No Way Home, Far From Home. Director. That's going to be dope. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that one yeah. a lot too. So yeah, he's he splits a lot of his time. Plus, he's married to like one of the most remarkable women in the world. Yeah, I'm on. Uh, yeah, like like a, a legit UN multi doctorate lawyer, international relief like. Per, like she, he literally married one of the most remarkable women in the world, yeah. and they've got kids, and so yeah, between all of his producing, directing, stuff like that, but he still has acting. Since stuff we're talking about wolves, since you brought up wolves, have you waxed rhapsodic about the accountant two getting made? Oh yeah, yes. we, yeah, we okay. That. I missed oh, yes. that because I can't wait. Uh, Chris was in that day, <laughs> and John Bernthal's coming back, Dude. and J.K. Simmons Come is on. coming back, and Come on. yes, I'm very excited about that. <laughs> Super excited about yeah, that. I just want to make sure. All right, what's next? Um, Nataku says, how well do you think Ghostbusters will do after the second week, especially with Godzilla and Kong? I I fear okay. for its health. Um, again, like 60... because even if Godzilla x Kong wasn't coming out, mm -hmm. again, and I, I say this as somebody who overall kind of enjoyed Ghostbusters Frozen Empire, but I do not think it's going to get a lot of repeat business. I, I mean, I, I kind of enjoy it, but I have no plans to watch it again. Uh, and it's not the kind of, it's not generating the word of mouth that people are going to go, that people who are on the fence are going to go, oh, I guess maybe I should go see it. Like, it's not generating that kind of word of mouth. So even take away Godzilla x Kong, I think Ghostbusters Afterlife takes more than a 60% drop. Now you add on top of that, that Godzilla x Kong is coming out, you might see a 70% drop. Uh, so I, I don't think it's got... A, a bright financial future ahead of it and, and maybe i'm wrong i hope that unless I godzilla x kong isn't good it's terrible yep <laughs> but even so. then the word's got to get out that it's terrible and so it's gonna they're projecting 45 to 55 to 60 million dollar opening weekend yeah, and, for and godzilla i don't kong. think there's any such thing as a terrible godzilla movie because not all godzilla movies were after all high art in the first place so i'll watch uh, you know just seeing godzilla with cranking it up with that pink light and blasting I, I would contend that there are terrible Godzilla movies <laughs> to you, sir. I would contend that there are. Well, that's are, what I mean. But you can't. No, there are, there are bad. There yeah. are bad Godzilla movies. But, but they're Godzilla movies, so you don't sit there and think that they're bad because they're not supposed <laughs> yeah. to be Gone with the Wind or Godfather or even Chinatown. All right. What's next? Uh, Dominic Suma says, their respective movies aside, what is the better executed scene to you? The pod race scene from Phantom Menace or the airport battle from Civil War? Airport battle. Yeah. Because there's there's... <clears throat> but the, look, I, as somebody who hates the prequels, there are things in the prequels that I really appreciate. The pod race being one of them. Yeah. I still can send the, the greatest sound design scene in the history of film. The sound design of the pod race scene is mind-blowingly good. Yeah, it is. Um, and I love it. But there's, I always talk about how action without narrative purpose is just visual noise. There is clearly narrative purpose in the Padre scenes, but there's so much inter-character drama going on with the airport battle in Civil War that it's just a, a, a remarkable sequence on several levels, right? I just, you're seeing heroes fighting each other. They got individual storylines going on, and I, yeah, so I give it that. What would you give them? Also, on? you know, I'm going to go with this Civil War sequence the pod racing sequence is a beautifully constructed sequence. Yes, absolutely. But it has no, first of all, there's no, uh, you know what the outcome is. The characters, I cannot stand, look, as much as I like Ben Quadneros from playing that damn video game for the, what, N64? <laughs> ben Quadneros! I mean, Sebulba's a terribly designed character. I hate the fact that all the other pod racers, they're not credible characters. If they were cool, 
Like if if you were watching Days of Thunder and you had like a Michael Rooker character that was tormenting, you know, that and you believe that there's a possibility that Anakin might get beat or something, you just know it's it's all a goof. It's just a, like here's a great effect sequence, isn't this cool? But there's no as cool and it is, man. It's so cool. The the speed, the sound design, I love watching it, but I don't feel a thing. Man, I, I still remember, even though the first time I watched I was just so giddy that I was watching a new Star Wars movie. I was just filled with happiness. Yeah. That euphoria that I felt like watching a new Star Wars movie, I know the moment it ended. And it was when the Howard Cosell wannabe pod race play, like, welcome to the pod race here. And it's like, oh, my God. I don't care what universe you're in. That's got to hurt. Oh, my God. It's, I, look, I, I know we're all about revisionist history. I know that about a lot of different things. <laughs> a lot of people do a lot of revisionist history about a lot of different things, but I will never understand the movement we've had in the last couple of years of people trying to recreate history about when the prequels came out. Guys, the prequels are garbage. <laughs> they are straight up fire. And you know, you know what was interesting? You know, okay, go ahead. Pe people were having an, ex I know I was having an existential crisis because we didn't understand you came out of that movie yeah. going, wait a minute, wait, what? Because everybody, if there was one movie in the universe that people were primed to love and give it a wide berth if it wasn't so great. Hugely wide berth. It was that movie. Yes. And that movie even diminished, I mean, that let everybody down. The whole planet was walking around for a week going, what I happened? I was watching people in the live chat giving random lines like, try spinning. That's a good trick. Uh, <laughs> ah, uh, ah, I'm getting PTSD just thinking about. Uh, I'm clenching my fists. <laughs> we must disrupt all communications. Down Are you there. an angel? <laughs> it's like, and I'm, I'm sorry, but like, oh, there's been a planetary invasion. Oh, no, there hasn't. I suggest we send a team to research it. What are you talking about? You, you literally got space cell phones that you can get on his talk. Is your planet being invaded? Yes? Okay, well, there we go. We must com disrupt all communications down Droids there. using binoculars. Droids using binoculars. <laughs> Now that's a that's a that's a nitpick, but yes, I mean I mean ridiculous. you've got whatever ocular things you have, but you have to use binoculars to augment your what? Roger, your Roger. lenses are, are those fixed? Fo is that a fixed focal length? What are those? Thirty-five millimeter, and you can't see any further than that. Come on now. <sighs> again, but again, I will always I am always open to talking about the things I really did like about the the prequels. It's just about overall. There's always a bigger fish, John. There's always a bigger fish. Oh, leaking in no power? Cold when are you thinking we are in trouble? Planet core. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, at least we can sit here and do all the dialogue from beginning yep, to end. Probably. I can. I saw that movie like 20 times, man. I, I can recite every word. I still it. have my Japanese laser disc I'm not parting with ever. <sighs> all right. <laughs> What's next? All right. Uh, August talks about movies, I guess. Says, do you still think Mufasa the Lion King will come out this year? And we haven't heard much about it. I haven't heard anything about it moving. Um, I'm not going to... Listen, I loved the CG animated remake. I, I really did. It's not as good as the original one, but I, I really did have a good time with it. And yet I have no... I have no excitement for this Mufasa project. I don't know if it's just the fact that I'm just not big on prequels in general or whatever, but yeah, I, I have no interest in it right now. A, a good trailer can totally change my mind. Absolutely it can. But uh, I haven't heard anything about it being delayed, so my guess is it's still going to come out. Still being made, you know. Yep. Nose to the grindstone. All right, what's next? Uh, David Coca says, or Coca says, uh, greetings from Hamilton, John. My it's, hometown. It's my birthday today. Happy birthday. Going to Chicago-style pizza and then a movie at Cineplex and Castor Meadowlands. You know what? I heard some very something very disturbing. For anybody in Hamilton, I heard on my last trip back that... Uh, Pat, who owned Chicago style, my all time favorite restaurant, I heard he sold it and it's under new ownership and the food quality went to crap. No one else cares about this other than people who live in the hammer in, in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. But find out for me if that is true because that's uh, that really makes me sad if that's true. You know what? We should send two Jedi to go find out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what they do at the beginning of Phantom Menace. They sit down in a room and wait. For somebody to bring their order. Yeah. 
you know, they get a little water from from a protocol droid. <laughs> All right, what's next? Um, let's see. Fian Cleary says, uh, hi, John and crew. One of the reasons I'm looking for I'm myself laugh. Come on. All right. One of the reasons I'm looking forward to Fallout is seeing Walton Goggins. Absolutely yeah. loved him in The Shield and Justified. He is great as Boyd Crowder. Uh, have you seen him in that? Also, what are your thoughts on his role as Venus with Tig in uh, SOA? Listen, if you want to see how good of an actor Walton Goggins is, see him in Sons of Anarchy. He's great. Like it's if you want to talk about somebody who who puts on display range as an actor. He's so good in Sons of Anarchy. Um, I, he he lets you buy into it, and then you watch something like, um, you, you know, the the other shows you mentioned, and he's he also recently they tried to build a sitcom around him recently, where he was a dad. What do they call him? Like not unicorn, but he was a dad whose wife recently passed away oh yeah and yeah. his kids and his friends are telling him it's time to start dating again and he's trying to start dating again as a widower and i was really in, interested in it because it's walton goggins and the premise sound funny i watched the pilot and like nope i'm out i <laughs> uh, didn't like it all that much i can't remember what the name of it was called can we, but can we do a 25th anniversary phantom menace show <laughs> oh my god I what up? i just keep that's stop, coming you know? up isn't it it is. They're they're doing it. It's being re-released in theaters. That's we, right. We should go and then afterwards do an appreciation show because I want to talk Captain Tarples, man. <laughs> Captain Tarples, son. You you what? Oh I'll bring God. out I'll bring out all the these the the Hasbro twelve uh six or six scale figures I bought for the Phantom Menace. Oh, this time that I gotcha. put away in a bag and never took out again. You indeed do do this time. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> maybe my Chancellor Valorum figure will finally come out of the box. You know what? Maybe we should do a 25th anniversary watch along of, of the Phantom. I totally Man. should, dude. The poster for it's beautiful. Oh, Matt the, Ferguson. The posters painted are it. great. Yeah. The really trailer beautiful. was, I think, great. The tra Honestly. listen, it's I, I still look in my movie, movie trailer's a love story. I say it's the most significant movie trailer of all time. It's an incredible trailer. It, it's a great trailer and the but yeah, whoo. Anyway. All right, what's next? <laughs> Brandon Collins says, hey, John and crew, we all know it was a mistake to not give Roadhouse theatrical distribution, but if it had come out in direct competition with Ghostbusters this weekend, how do you think it would have fared? That's a good question. Yeah. Um, I mean, I wouldn't have released it on the same week ago as Ghostbusters mm -hmm. because you're talking, not only are you talking about kind of similar demographics, but they're both playing through the nostalgia factor a little bit, all that kind of stuff. It's not a good week to release it. I would have released it maybe last week during Kung Fu Panda 4's second weekend in theaters. That's what I would have done. Listen, Roadhouse was not going to make $400 million in theaters. But it would have made $200 million. Pete, you know what? Not opening weekend. I mean, overall, it would have made $200 It million. would have been a thing. Yeah. People would, not just nostalgia, it would have been, oh, we got to go see Roadhouse in the theater. It would have been, it would have been an event people would want to participate in. Yeah, totally agree. All right, what's next? All right, uh, Joe Joey Hawkins says, "Hey, can't be a crew. Uh, hope you're all well. New movie recommendation for y'all: The Persian Version. I thought it was one of the most beautiful films I've seen in a very long time. I've never heard of it. I don't know it either. I, it's, uh, clearly, it's got to be a direct streaming thing. Probably, probably one of the many, many, many troves of Netflix projects that yeah. they never market. I'll watch it. I'll keep my eye open for it. All right, what's next? All right, Mr. Max Moore says, "What makes more opening weekend the first Super Mario Brothers movie twenty 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 three? Uh, one three day, one hundred forty six point six million. The Minecraft movie or the second Super Mario Brother movie? So oh, we know definitely the, not the Minecraft movie, not at all. John think, Minecraft's really popular. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. understand Minecraft is really popular. So is Pokemon, and nobody <laughs> went to go see it. I don't even know if the second one beats the first Mario. Yeah, Brother. no, um, I I don't think the second one beats the first one either. I I I mean, I think a Mario Brothers two will do great. Yeah, but it's not going to be the same numbers as the first movie. And Minecraft definitely does not have it. Um, and we always have these debates when stuff like this comes up. But, John, you don't understand. This, whatever this is, is super popular. That that doesn't equal box office. I mean, again, go back to it again. But I remember when the new, the new, let's call it the most recent um, uh, Thunderbums. What's their name? Power Rangers. <laughs> When the latest Power oh, Rangers, bombs. <laughs> <laughs> when the latest, when the most recent Power Rangers came out with Elizabeth Banks was in it, I remember I had so many people like laughing at me because I did not believe that movie was going to be a billion dollar film. 
And it's like, John, you just don't get it. You just don't get it. You don't understand how popular the uh, the fucking Power Rangers are. You just don't know. I'm like, I look, it doesn't matter how popular it is. People don't want to go see it as a movie. And they didn't. Same thing happened with Detective Pikachu. So many people, and you guys remember, so many people insisting that that movie was going to be a billion. Because because Pokemon is the number one IP in the world. And it is. That doesn't mean people want to go see a movie about it. And no, Minecraft would not be nearly as big as Mario Brothers was. Just would not be nearly as big. There's just so many other factors that go into it. Uh, I'm not saying they couldn't make a successful Minecraft movie, but not a billion dollar Minecraft. I don't know, Rob. But am I crazy? What do you think? No, I don't think you're crazy. I mean, look, Super Mario. The thing about Minecraft is, you know, the very name, Super Mario Brothers. When you hear, hear you you think about Mario and Luigi. It's people. Yeah. When you think about Minecraft, what's the first thing you think about? Spoiled kids. Well, I mean, that's the problem. I, the, the Minecraft is like a world. It's a thing. It's a. It's 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 not what Mario is because, you know, with Mario, you've been playing him all the way back to Donkey Kong. Yeah. And Mario Kart and all that. Whereas Minecraft is not that. I have, I have no idea why I said Thunder Bombs. Now I want to see Thunder Bombs. Somebody make that movie. Not Thunder Force. Mm, no, don't no. make another one of those. No, no yeah, sir. Not good. All right, let's take like two more. What's next? <laughs> All right. Ivan uh, says, 30 years ago, a good Canadian kid, Jim Carrey, had an incredible breakout year. Can't believe it was 30 years ago. Can you rank these three main releases from best to worst? Ace Ventura, The Mask, Dumb and Dumber. Dumb and Dumber for me is number one. It still holds up. <sighs> Dumb and Dumber 100% still holds up today. Yep. And you know what? I even like the sequel. I'm not talking about when they had other yeah. actors. No, I'm Dumb talking about the too. legit, you know, uh, Jeff and and uh, uh, Jim sequel. I, I know that got a, not a lot of people respond to it. I thought it was still funny. Nowhere near as good as the original. The original is great. But there are not many movies in the history of movies that have made me laugh so ridiculously hard as the first Ace Ventura Peck Detective. It doesn't age nearly as well as Dumb and Dumber does. It doesn't have the same impact as Dumb and Dumber still has. But I still remember watching Ace Ventura Pet Detective for the first time, and it was like, I didn't know, I was young, but I didn't know how funny movies could be. When I, I didn't know fun movies could make me laugh this hard as the first Ace Ventura. Again, doesn't age nearly as well as Dumb and Dumber, but I, I would kind of put. And Ace the Mask Ventura is a more. respectable film too, dude. Me and my friends, we I remember me and my friends all lived in the house together, and we practically wore out the VHS tape of that. We watched it every freaking day, yeah, laughing harder every single day. And there has never been an individual, male or female, who has been to me as smoking hot in a movie as Cameron Diaz in that movie. I don't think any man or woman has looked as physically good as she did in that movie. Have you have you seen I don't know if it was this year. They were talking maybe it was last year they were talking it's a one of the variety I think round tables with actors and Jim Carrey tells the story about how Siskel and Ebert completely destroyed Ace Ventura Pet Detective and it really made him feel bad and then later after a few of his movies had come out, <clears throat> they they made an apology. They came out and said, we were wrong about Jim Carrey. And they said, he's our modern day, he's taken clowns and the idea of what a performer can do. And he showed us a new kind of humor uh, that human beings are capable of that we didn't understand because it was new at first and more power to him. And Carrey said that that was one of the most meaningful things that happened in his career when he received an apology wow. from them. That's hilarious. It's really moving. It's That's it's on funny. YouTube. I just watched it. It's a really moving uh, clip. All right. Let's uh, last one of the day. What's next? Uh, Luis uh, says, Westerns, do you think we're ready for a good Western movie? It seems we are due for one, and Viggo Mortensen just finished directing one. I hope it doesn't suck. We're always... We're getting the two-part Horizon by Kevin Costner. I, I still have my doubts. Come on, dude. I have my doubts. Open about Range that. is awesome. I like Open Range. Silverado. Very much. Yeah, I I like Open Range I like very open much. Range I have my Dance doubts. Wolves. But I love Kevin Costner, so we'll see how this turns out. But I mean, we're all there's never a bad time for a good western. Yeah. We don't get a lot of them. No. Um, like maybe we should. It's been a long time since we've had like a good three ten to Yuma or whatever. But um, 
again, a lot of people got their sights set on this Kevin Costner one. I didn't think the trailer was all that good, but I know a lot of you guys are very excited about it, and I always get excited about Kevin Costner. I like him a lot. I've been a big fan of his for a long time. So uh, we'll see. We'll see. But it would be great to see a really... I think we need two or three good Westerns every year. I mean, that's what I think we really need, two or three good Westerns every year. I don't think we'll ever get to that point again, but it'd be nice if we did. Mm -hmm. All right. And that'll do it for today's installment of the John Campy Show podcast. Thank you so much for being here, guys, and making this little show part of your day. Big special thank you to all you guys who sent in questions, whether you're channel members or use the Super Chat. Number one, because you gave us fun things to talk about. But number two, you supported our channel as you did it, and all of us involved with the show. Thank you guys so very much for your support. Don't forget to come on back and join us again tomorrow. Hopefully, Ray will be back. Join us again. But I want to thank the people in the room with me. In the meantime, Jonathan Voico. See you guys tomorrow. Writer, director, producer, Robert Meyer Burnett. Ben Quadraneros back in theaters. <laughs> ben Quadraneros. My name's John Campion. And until next time, my friends, bye-bye.